Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on Accounting for Nature. My name is Veronica Coyle, and I'm from Data for Good. Data for Good is a not-for-profit organization, and our mission is to inspire and enable people with access to data or who have data skills to use these to benefit humanity and the world. I'm speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. And I'd like to start by paying my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, just a quick word on the format today before I introduce the first of our fantastic speakers. You may have noticed that we're using the webinar format of Zoom, so your cameras and mics are off, but we definitely do want to, have your, to hear your questions and comments. So if you move your mouse to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A button. Please enter questions as we go, and don't forget to include who the question is for. So the format will be that we'll hear from both of our speakers and have the Q&A at the end. So it'd be helpful if you could uh, start your question by saying it's for Scott or it's for Amanda, and that way I'll direct it to whoever's appropriate. So let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Scott Agnew is the General Manager of Certification Systems, Innovation and Technology at Accounting for Nature. He has degrees in science and journalism, a master's of energy studies, and a PhD applying system dynamics to complex sustainable energy transitions. He has worked at the senior and executive level on diverse projects including the development of several flagship clean energy initiatives for the Queensland government and strategic policy development for the agricultural industry. Scott, thank you for joining us today and welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Veronica. Um, I really appreciate Data for Good hosting us today. Uh, the work you guys are doing using data to help drive positive outcomes, it's really just so important. And that's going to be the focus of the webinar. How can we use the developments in data collection and analytics to better understand and manage the environment? So I'll just share my screen quickly. Hopefully you can all see that. <clears throat> all right, so today I'm going to give you a quick rundown on what environmental accounting is. I'll talk about uh, accounting for nature, what we do, and I'll touch on a new tech platform that we're developing. And then I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Amanda, and she's gonna drill down a bit deeper on the technical side on how we actually use data to create an environmental account. So we might as well start at the beginning, uh, by getting everybody on the same page. Environmental accounting measures the actual biophysical condition or health of an environmental asset which is a bit different from natural capital accounting, which estimates the potential economic benefits that uh, environmental assets uh, may provide to society. So these terms have been bandied around in academic and government circles for decades, but it, it seems like now we're only starting to see mainstream interest in this area. And why is this the case? So natural systems are worth an estimated $125 trillion worldwide per year. And, and they provide the, the ecosystem services which keep us alive. They provide us with food, water security, protect us from climate impacts, and of course, improve our health. But um, every year we're, we're pumping millions of dollars into the environment. But what we don't have is a clear data-driven approach to understand what is actually going on in the environment. And, and the thing is, what we've been doing to date isn't going to really cut it going forward. We're going to need far greater investment in the environment to stabilise the damage that already exists. We're going to need more targeted finance, new policy frameworks, things like, for example, um, like regulated natural capital markets, where the health of environmental assets are, are properly monetized. And really, to make this happen at scale, we're going to need reliable and quantitative based environmental accounts accounting. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, up until recently, it hasn't really existed at the level it needs to be, you know, to underpin the kinds of investments and the management activities that will achieve sustainability at scale. I always use the example of carbon markets. Um, they're a really good example of where environmental accounting needs to be. 
as you all know, there, there are very scientifically supported ways in which to measure carbon and to unitize it as tons of CO2 equivalent. So as a result, we're seeing these thriving carbon markets emerge all over the world. He, even here in Australia, where you know we're, we're kind of laggards, the, the voluntary carbon market um, prices a ton of CO2 equivalent at roughly $17. And to my mind, this, this is really the holy grail in many ways, because suddenly you have externality costs being integrated into projects, which of course helps drive uptake. And while environmental accounting is where carbon accounting was probably maybe 10 to 15 years ago, I am optimistic that this field is actually gonna accelerate faster than even carbon has in recent years. I can't stress just uh, how much interest we've been seeing from governments and uh, companies here in Australia and around the world. Um, we're getting corporates who wanna invest in biodiversity for ESG and uh, governments um, are starting to really understand that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. <clears throat> and that brings us to accounting for nature. While you know, we've only been a company for a, a couple of years, Accounting for Nature's origin story actually began more than 10 years ago. What happened was uh, several of Australia's uh, best known scientists got together at the local pub and they realised more needed to be done for the environment in Australia. And on that day, they decided to form the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists, which incidentally was the name of the pub they were meeting at, which I've always thought was pretty funny. Anyway, after a few pints, the scientists around the, the table that night realised that we didn't have a, a quantitative, consistent approach to measuring the condition of the environment. So in the, the following months, um, they went to work and they came up with the concept of an ECON, which stands for Environmental Condition Index. What that is, it's a common unit of measure, and it describes the condition of any asset at any scale as an index between zero and 100 where zero is a completely degraded asset and 100 is an asset in its uh, undegraded or pristine state. The great thing about the econ is it's very elegant because it allows us to compare <clears throat> the relative condition of different environmental assets. And then we can aggregate that to, to simply communicate the health of the environment. Now, I'm not gonna go into any more detail on that right now because Amanda is gonna break down the econ for you in the next session in a bit more detail. Anyway, um, where was I? The Wentworth Group uh, with CSIRO and about 200 scientists, they got to work to develop and, and test this new way of measuring the condition of environmental, environmental assets uh, with several regional scale trials. And in 2019, a couple of years ago, the Wentworth Group decided it was time to spin out their IP and Accounting for Nature was formed as a not-for-profit not um, with the intention to operationalize the Wentworth Group's environmental accounting framework. And this stuff is really important, which is why I put up this slide. The Australian Financial Review wrote this article um, on Accounting for Nature a month or so ago. And the journalist made the claim that the development of an accounting system for Australia's natural capital is as profound as the first use of financial accounts in business and the introduction of reliable statistical measures for economic activity. It's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, and it, and it certainly is a bold claim, but, but to me, it really highlights the importance of environmental accounting, not just for sustainability, uh, but for the economy more broadly, and, and, and that's going to be even more important in, in coming years. So look, I might take a few minutes now to talk about what Accounting for Nature actually does. So we certify environmental accounts against the accounting for nature standard. And what that means is we certify the science or, or rather the scientific methodologies that underpin the measurement of environmental accounts. Um, why is environmental account certification important? Well, we've got landholders, businesses, investors, governments, they all need to be able to answer questions about uh, sustainability outcomes and, and provi provide proof of any sustainability claims they're making. And this is becoming more and more important, you know, waving a photo of a koala or a wombat and making broad-based sustainability claims that aren't supported, they're just not gonna stand up to scrutiny as new natural capital markets are starting to form. What they need is a defensible scientifically backed evidence base. And they can get this by building an environmental account with Accounting for Nature. Once you've measured the condition of your environmental assets, then you can come to us, get your account certified, and we have a whole auditing and verification framework that underpins that process. 
Uh, we also accredit new scientific methods using our standards and accreditation committee, or as we like to call it, the SAC. On the SAC, we have some of the top scientific names in their respective fields, and they are completely independent and they keep us honest with the science. And their main focus is to make sure the scientific un principles underpinning accounting for nature methods are rigorous and consistent. So we currently have nine accredited methods and we should have more than 16 by the end of this year. We also train and accredit experts so they can help build environmental accounts. And from October, we'll be providing an online environmental accounting system. And I'm gonna talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Now to make all this happen, we have some amazing partners. We have Science Grunt through CSIRO. The Queensland government have been amazing in providing financial support using uh, the AFN framework to underpin uh, elements of their $500 million land restoration fund. And we've got carbon aggregators, CO2 Australia, Green Collar, uh, land conservation groups like Tasmanian Land Conservancy and Queensland Trust for Nature. And we've also got some large farm groups as well. Um, the Burnett Mary Regional Group has been a great partner and we've been rolling out workshops to their people. And what they're doing is undertaking the development of uh, a regional level account, which is really exciting, making really uh, large amounts of headway with that particular project. Um, importantly, Accounting for Nature has positioned itself to align with most of the major international standards. In fact, uh, one of our board members was, was uh, chair of the United Nations Standards for Environmental Economic Accounting for many years. And this international alignment is, is particularly important because so often policy and even market-based schemes, they're created in response to international agreements. If you look at carbon, a lot of the action is happening at the global level in response to the Paris Agreement. Um, and this has helped encourage companies to invest in carbon markets. Interestingly, what we're seeing now is a big push by companies who not only want to participate in carbon markets, but they want to buy carbon offsets with extra environmental co-benefits attached to them. And these are sometimes referred to as nature-based solutions to climate change or carbon plus, with plus being the environmental benefits. And it's this kind of thing that has really seen increased interest in new biodiversity projects and, and subsequently, I suppose, frameworks that can properly measure environmental condition. I might just talk briefly about what is actually included in an environmental account. Accounting for nature includes five main assets. We've got soil, native fauna, freshwater, marine, and native vegetation. Now for carbon, we already have a well-regulated framework set up federally. So Accounting for Nature doesn't actually do carbon methods. What we're really interested in regards to carbon and what's missing is, is recognition of those um, environmental co-benefits that are created as part of a carbon project. And we are working with a clean energy regulator. We've been down to Canberra a few times to have these environmental co-benefits recognized when they're traded with ACUS, Australian Carbon Credit Units. Um, you'll also notice on this slide the three different confidence level, uh, confidence level logos. Um, what they mean is that depending on the purpose of an environmental account, a proponent might use a method that has been rated with a different level of scientific rigor. For example, you might have a small landholder who might be using the accounting for nature framework really just to under, better understand the condition of one or two assets on their properties like native vegetation or their, their soil, for example. And all they might need for this is a level three account, which would be simpler and cheaper, cheaper to implement, but still be accurate enough to be able to identify trends in the condition of the, the environmental assets on their property. On the other hand, uh, you might have proponents seeking access to new markets or maybe improving the value of their carbon credits or accessing government funding. And they require a level one or level two confidence level to provide greater certainty uh, around the quality of the data that underpins their environmental accounts. So accounting for nature can be uh, applied at multiple scales. Effectively, that means what are the spatial boundaries of the environmental account? We have the larger scale, such as regional scale, uh, and then the smaller scale, such as property or project scales. And what's happening is we're currently starting with a mix of environmental uh, accounts uh, at different scales around Australia. All of the information that we can get from these projects actually can feed up into a broader landscape view. 
So the way we figure it, as more environmental accounts are created, we're very interested in linking the data together to get a much clearer understanding of the broader environmental condition across whole ecosystems and, and in future across states and eventually countries. I mean, if we can achieve that, that would absolutely be amazing. So how are we going to achieve our rather lofty goals? Uh, a key take home here is that we want to achieve scale with the Accounting for Nature framework so that more and more people and organisations are using a consistent scientific approach to measuring the condition of the environment. We need to get away from greenwashing. We need to be able to see the things that are actually happening on the ground have meaning and are having impact. Um, so I've already touched on that first box there, but I think it's probably worth jump onto this next slide to show you what we've achieved with the Canning for Nature in just a very short time. So we've got uh, 19 projects registered and we're a little East Coast centric. Um, the good news is we have some absolutely enormous projects in the pipeline and they'll fill out this map of Australia very nicely. I had a, um, a call from a large carbon aggregator uh, last week and they're talking about registering 20 additional projects in the coming few weeks. So um, lots happening at the moment for environmental accounting. Uh, and if you want any more details about these projects, you can take a look at our website and um, each of the projects talks about their purpose and, and has some of the key information that you might be interested in. Back to our achieving our vision slide. Um, now for the second box there, a key focus for Accounting for Nature is to train people to do environmental accounting. As I said before, Environmental accounting in some ways is pretty new in that for, for decades, many years, it's, it's been almost a purely academic pursuit. We want to get as many people to understand how to do this so we can train up a workforce who understands it and can implement it. Uh, and we have these online training mod modules you can access from our web website, which have been very well received by both environmental experts and generalists uh, alike. And yeah, I do encourage you to, to check those uh, resources out. And this map here shows where we've undertaken training courses. In fact, our partnership with Landcare Australia um, has seen us lead one of the largest dedicated environmental accounting training programs ever undertaken in Australia. And we've been doing that all over the country over the last uh, six months or so. And finally, the third box there is all about technology. This is, this is the fun stuff. What we want to do is we want to create a tech platform, a bit like Xero for financial accounting, if any of you guys use that. And basically where your accounts appear on a dashboard that show you all the data in a nice, clear and easy to access format. Now, as part of our first build, which we're already quite advanced on, the technology platform is going to be able to take any data generated as part of an approved method and upload it to create an environmental account. So we're all already building a, a data collection app you can take out into the field on your phone or a tablet and it will lead you through a method. So you basically um, can go out on, onto your property and, and the phone will take you through the steps and the requirements of that method. The data is stored in your phone and then when you get back to Wi-Fi or whatever, it connects and that data is uploaded onto the platform. Um, we're gonna be releasing the beta version of our tech platform for testing in October. And it's the plan is it will generate a, play, a page like this one on, on the slide here which will include key bits of information. Um, we're already certifying uh, projects at the moment and we, have, we will have project pages that look like that online very shortly as well. Um, but we also have a very ambition, uh, ambitious vision for our tech platform going forward. We all know how fast tech has been developed in recent years. You know, you've got your sensor technology in cars and planes in your watch and in your phone. Uh, in medicine space, it, it really kind of blows my mind what uh, technology is able to do in our society. And the best bit is we are starting to see so much of this advanced technology find its way into environmental monitoring, be it um, drones or satellites, um, remote soil and water sensors. We've got machine learning and AI now that can recognize different species. and, and even uh, specific individuals. I just learned recently about 
work that's using photo capture and AI to identify turtles by looking at their facial characteristics, which is, is mind blowing. There's even this um, cool technology, some of you might be familiar with called uh, eDNA, where you basically take a sample from the environment, it might be soil, water, can even be snow, and, and basically any DNA that is shed uh, into that sample is analyzed using sequencing and then it's compared against uh, DNA libraries. This means, you know, for those tricksy animals, which most of them are, that don't like to be seen, you can use the technology and get a clearer idea of what is living in the vicinity of those samples. And we're looking at using that actually in one of our projects um, coming up. So that's very exciting. Um, now, while we don't have a lot of this uh, advanced functionality in the first build, we expect that the next iterations developed over the coming six to 12 months will be integrating this kind of thing. And we've been talking to our developers and, and we believe we can do it and we'll be able to do it quite well. So um, where we want to head with this, for, for level three environmental accounts, if, just to remind you, they're the more simple accounts, we hope proponents will be able to generate econs and really data rich visualizations at the click of a button using a variety of advanced sensor technologies just the the granularity that you can get with satellites and drones and things like that um, to be able to generate these level three accounts is um, really cool but for level one and two accounts the the, the more uh, scientifically rigorous accounts we're still going to need to get ecologists out on the ground doing field work but there will still be elements that we can digitize and, and make it far easier for them when creating environmental accounts. And what these developments mean for Accounting for Nature is that we can reach more people who will be able to generate environmental accounts. And they'll be able to do this uh, eat more easily and, and far more cost effectively than anyone's ever been able to do them in the past. Um, and in time, we will really start to get a much clearer understanding of the health of our environment. And this means we can hopefully implement more effective measures to help um, improve it. So watch this space, very exciting times. Um, now I might just wrap up my section now and hand it over to Amanda. Um, just in way of introduction, uh, Amanda is our training program manager. She's more than 10 years experience in uh, environmental and natural research manage management. Amanda's got a bachelor in geology and climatology, a master's of environmental management. And for a sin, she's currently finishing off a PhD uh, and she's looking at impacts of climate change on alpine and Arctic forests. Uh, Amanda's been pretty busy since uh, she started with Accounting for Nature a little year, over a year ago. And she's currently focused on delivering face-to-face -face and online training material for us. So I'll leave you in her capable hands for the next session here. Thank you so much, Scotty. Let's see if I can share my screen. There we go. Um, so I don't really need to introduce myself because Scotty did that so brilliantly. Um, but what I am going to talk about today is how we actually build environmental accounts that um, Scott was talking about. So how do we um, collect the data and how do we actually utilize the data and present it um, in a usable way? So before I go into the actual process of building an account, it's really important to consider the purpose of account development. So we're very much um, purpose focused in our certification scheme. So we have a lot of people um, coming to us wanting to build accounts for a range of different um, reasons. And the reasons of why they want to build an account will influence um, the appropriate method for them to use. So at the most simple level, um, we have farmers and landholders who come to us who want to just track the environment and see how it changes over time. Maybe they are doing um, reforestation projects and they wanna see how that process is going and they actually wanna be given some sort of um, number and also some sort of validation of the efforts that they put in. Um, so um, the environmental accounts can really easily be used um, to do that, to track change in environment over time. And they're the ones who would use the level three method that Scotty spoke about. So the lower confidence level, um, they're meant to be easy for anyone to implement. Now, there's a lot of other reasons why people want to build environmental accounts as well. A lot of those are financial reasons. Um, so as already mentioned, there's something called co-benefits to carbon credits. Um, in particularly in Queensland, this has been a big driver for the uptake of environmental accounting. 
Um, so in addition to getting payment for that carbon credits, um, proponents can also get paid for environmental co-benefits. So we can certify those co-benefits. Another kind of more emerging market um, to use environmental accounts is for um, insurance companies and for banks. So we're seeing in Australia and all over the world um, that the impact of climate change is really putting a lot of ecosystems at risk. And the more degraded these ecosystems are from the start, the more vulnerable they will be to climate change. So if you can prove that you are managing the environment on your property, you can prove that you're a low risk investment um, and the, that you might be a lower risk to insure compared to your neighbors. Um, so people are using environmental data to negotiate better deals um, with the banks and with the insurance companies. Another thing that we do is, because at the bottom line, we are a certification scheme. Um, so we do kind of provide that logo, that tick of approval. Um, and we've seen such as with other environmental certification schemes like organic, that people are a lot of times willing to pay a premium for these products. And so that means that farmers who are trying to really do the right thing can actually see a bit of financial benefit from going through the certification process um, in that they can require a bit of a premium on their product. Now, lastly, we can also be used um, more on a government level um, to track performance of investments and criteria grants. So this can be either government or also um, other financial sectors. Um, but for example, say that you're managing um, national parks across New South Wales, for example, you can use our framework to identify which national parks you should put your efforts in, so which ones are lagging. Um, and you can also really see um, how those investments are tracking in terms of what benefit do they bring to the environment. So there's a lot of different um, purposes of why you want to build an account. And because there's a lot of different purposes, there's also a lot of different methods that are appropriate depending on how you want to use that data. So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty detail of all the standards and documents. Um, I just want to highlight that all these documents are available on our website in case anyone's interested. So we have our standard, which is the more overarching document that we follow. We then have technical protocols that guide the method development process. So because our methods are built um, to fit specific purposes, uh, we do continuously approve more and more methods. And so if people want to use our framework, but there's no suitable method already established, um, we do allow for new method development as well. We have audit rules, definitely not going to go into those today, um, but I do want to point out number five, which is the information statement. Um, and that's the big kind of publicly facing document um, that comes along with the account development process. So anyone who is building an environmental account and going through the certification process is required to produce what we call an information statement. And that's a publicly facing documents um, that's available for anyone to download. And it's therefore mainly transparency. So people can see exactly what you measured, how you measured it, um, and what your econ is that I will just explain more in just a moment. Um, but it can also be there for marketing purposes. So people who go through our certification process can get a QR code um, and they can put that on products and then consumers can scan that and it will take them to the information statement about their property or the project, whatever it might be. Um, lastly, we also have a certification quick guide and fee schedule available on our website. So we have a few different um, certification tiers and they all have different costs associated with them. But if you happen to be interested, you can jump up on our website and have a look at our fee schedule. Now let's go into the actual data collection and usage. Um, so I'm going to go through our five step process on how you can create an environmental account. So first we have the design phase, which is possibly the most important phase um, of an environmental account creation. So that's when you decide uh, why you wanna create an environmental account, who is it gonna be used by, um, and what area should you cover and what types of assets, environmental assets, do you actually wanna measure? Um, and that's what influences both what method that's suitable for your project, um, as well as how you go about the actual um, stratification and sampling of data. Registration process, pretty straightforward. Um, I'm gonna cover the build process in more detail as well. That's how you actually go out and collect the data and how you calculate um, that e -cont. 
And lastly, um, it's just submitting all of the data to us for the certification and then the maintenance. Um, so you need to, we need to stay in touch basically every year to see how you're tracking and how you're going. And we need your account to be um, updated every five years at a minimum. So we do encourage people to go out and measure and monitor environmental change on a yearly basis, um, but we require a minimum of every five years um, to have your account certified. And once you are certified, um, you get access to our lovely logos to use. Now, the econ that we've been talking about, um, it stands for Environmental Condition Index. It's a scale ranging from zero to 100. Um, 100 meaning a pristine environment, more or less. Um, and zero is basically a standing and measuring environmental condition on a concrete slab. So the reason and why it's so important that we have this um, scale from zero to 100 is because we all speak the same language. And that means that you can compare the condition across different assets, but also between assets um, in different geographic locations. And so that goes back to what I spoke about with the national parks, that you can actually get a score from zero to 100 on any national park that you might be managing. And so you can easily see where you should probably put in your efforts if your intention is to improve the overall environmental condition across your national parks. Um, the second thing that's really important and beautiful with that econ scale from zero to 100 is that it allows for aggregation. Um, so what I mean by that is that if you have um, an area where you have lots of farmers using our framework, all these properties will then get a score from zero to 100. But you can aggregate these up into larger scales. So you could get a score from the region, for example, by using these property accounts. And because the way we um, split in accounts into smaller subsections um, for measurement, I'm going to talk more about that too, um, it also means that you will have data for small areas. So you can scale both um, up and down um, using this framework. Now the econ is based on something we call a reference benchmark. Now the reference benchmark is um, in general described as the undergraded state or condition of an asset. In Australia, um, we use um, what we call the pre-European extent, um, which means what did the environment look like before we had the European settlement in Australia? And that's what we use to compare the environmental conditioning. Um, and so this is quite different from a lot of other environmental frameworks that are meshing um, condition is that they will use the base year. So the first year of measurement as the baseline. So we don't use that as the baseline, but we use the undergraded state of the environment as the baseline. Um, and so if you get a score of 100, it, it basically means that you're measuring a pristine, untouched um, environment. Now, something that I want to introduce that we haven't spoken about yet is that in addition to the econd, we also have something that we called a PECOND. Um, and the PECOND is the Productive Condition Index. Now, this is really um, useful for people in agriculture. So it's not all of our methods, but some of our methods include the PECOND measurement. And that basically means that you can measure using similar or the same indicators, you can measure how suitable that area is for agricultural production, if that's grazing or cropping or whatever it might be. And so we always require environmental accounts to include an econd, um, but you can, if you want to also include a PECOND. And we do recommend to do that for productive environments because that allows you to see the trade-offs um, between um, environmental health and productive condition. So you can make informed decisions about how you actually want to manage your land. And so both the econ and PECON um, go from a scale from zero to 100, um, but the reference benchmark for PECON will be based on optimal productive um, conditions instead of the undergraded state of the environment. Now, all our methods look slightly different. So these are just examples from two of our methods. Um, so one for native vegetation and one for soil. So every method will include a range of indicators. And an indicator is basically uh, one part of that type of uh, asset that can give you an indication of the overall health and quality of the asset. So for native vegetation we use, which is pretty standard in science, extent, configuration and composition. Um, so both looking at how much um, vegetation do you have, how well connected is that vegetation, 
as well as what's the overall structure. So how much grass cover, um, tree cover, whatever it might be, do you have in that area? Um, soil is very similar. Um, soil is usually pretty straightforward and a lot of people are already monitoring soil health, in particular in uh, productive ecosystems. Um, so most of these are just um, soil samples that are being sent to the lab and analysed. But so every method will have a range of different indicators um, that you can use. And the method prescribes exactly on how to apply them and how to collect that data. So you need to collect data for every indicator that we list. Now, the way that you know how and where to collect this data is through stratification. So stratification is basically breaking your account or area into smaller subsections um, where you take samples. So to give you an example of what this can look like, um, up on the map here, uh, on the top left corner, you can see we have something called pre-clear RE. And that's basically the regional ecosystem coding that we use here in Queensland. Um, and so just to walk you through these maps, so the top left map, we have two different types of ecosystems, 11.5.1 and 11.3.2. So the first step is figuring out what type of vegetation do I have on my property? The second step, which is the map on the right hand side, is to figure out the land use. Um, and this involves either mapping simply how you're utilizing um, your land, or it could also be um, seeing what are the broad condition states of your land. So if you want to measure the condition across your grazing property and you have a range of different paddocks and these paddocks all have different um, qualities on the environment, you might instead want to break them down depending on the quality of those paddocks. Anyway, to do this really simply, um, to find out our assessment units, what we do is just overlay these two maps. So everywhere you have one type of vegetation and one type of land use, you have one assessment unit. And so to create a representative econ for your whole property, what you would have to do is taking samples in every assessment unit. So every assessment unit will basically be given its own score, so its own econ. Um, and that is then aggregated to a property-wide econ. But what this means is that you can easily see what parts of your property is where you should focus your efforts. Um, and so all the assessment units will have samples underpinning a specific econ. Now, just to show you kind of a little bit about the structure that we're using. So this is what we call a data table. Um, so let's pretend um, that you've been out, you've done the mapping, you've gone and done the sampling. Um, this is what the data table will look like. So this is the data that underpins an econ. Um, so on the left hand side is where you would have the indicators. And then in the middle two um, columns is where you have the actual sample data. And then on the right hand side is the average um, for those sample data. And so that average is what we're using to calculate an econ. When we've done that step, the next uh, phase is to calculate something we call an indicated condition score. Now, the indicated condition score means that every single indicator that you went out and measured will get a score from zero to 100. And this makes it really easy, not just to see what parts of your property um, is where you want to put your effort in, but also seeing what indicators are kind of lagging. Um, so every single indicator will be given a score from zero to 100. And the method will kind of tell you how to do this. But to just give you an idea of what it can look like, um, this is from one of our native vegetation methods. And so you can see that on the left-hand side, we have those indicators that I've already mentioned for native vegetation. Uh, on the right-hand side is the formulas that we use to calculate these. Um, and what you need to put in is basically um, the reference condition. So that's the condition um, from the undergraded state. And the method will kind of go through and where and how you find this reference condition. Um, so for soil and vegetation, this might be from state mapping, um, but for other kinds of assets that have less information on them, this might be from expert opinion or from modeling. And you also enter the actual um, measurement data that you took uh, on your property. And so looking at formulas is not super intuitive. So I plotted them here instead, um, just to show you kind of the relationship between um, the measure and the reference benchmark and what that yields when it comes to an econ or an indicated condition score. So again, this is just an example from one of our methods. But um, 
to show you what a lot of the different indicators will look like, I can um, talk you through the shrub cover, which is the middle one here. And so you can see the indicator condition score on the left hand side, so that goes from zero to 100. Um, you then have the measure at the bottom as a percentage of benchmark. And that means where you have 100 here is, um, for example, say that you have um, a shrub cover of 50% um, as your reference benchmark. What you were now measured in the field was also 50%. That means that what you measured compared to the reference benchmark is exactly the same, which gives you 100% here. And so you can see that there's a range of different measures that would give you an indicated condition score of 100, because we know there's a lot of natural variability in ecosystems, and that doesn't necessarily mean that an ecosystem is uh, more or less healthy. Um, and so all the indicators will be giving different scores, and this is determined um, largely and approved by a standards and accreditation committee, uh, which goes through like the nitty gritty science of what we're doing and approving that. Now, when we speak about environmental accounts, um, this is pretty much what we mean. Um, so every, um, every indicator that we measured will be given a score, an indicated condition score. Um, every single area of your property or your project will be given an econ so you can compare different areas to each other. And we will then also give you an econ um, for your overall property or project. And so that's the data that's kind of um, available for the public um, to have a look at. And this is then presented in something that we call an information statement. So that's that publicly facing um, document that we talked about earlier. So that goes through exactly um, what you measured and where and how, um, but it also presents all the data and all the outcomes and results. Um, so for every project that goes through the certification project uh, process, the information statements will be available um, to download online on our website. And so last but not least, um, Scott has already mentioned that we have an online training um, platform. And so this is accessible um, through our website. So if you're interested in learning more, I would highly recommend um, going in on our website and having a look at potentially doing uh, online training. We have um, the first chapters are available for free if you just want to kind of dip your toes and see what you think. And if you want to learn more about the um, general parts of environmental accounting. Um, but we also have something we call accredited experts, which are those that actually build and develop accounts. Um, so if this is something that sounds interesting to you, we have more information on our website on the actual criteria um, that you need to meet to be eligible to become an expert. Um, but then also taking our training course is a big part um, of becoming an accredited expert. And that was all for me. Thank you so much for staying on and listening. Thank you, Amanda. In fact, both thank you, Scott and Amanda. That was both very informative presentations. And I have to admit, I was very impressed that not only are you collecting data, um, you have metrics that are both scientific and transparent, but um, I really love that you've paid so much attention to how that information gets presented back so it's usable. Um, so just a reminder to our audience as well that we're taking questions now, so feel free to use that question and answer box at the bottom of your screen to type questions in. If you want it directed to a particular speaker, let me know. Um, so the first question that we have uh, is, will some of the data being collected be added into national aggregation platforms such as the Atlas of Living Australia, so it has a broader application? Uh, yeah, I can take that one. So um, the Atlas of Living Australia is, is an amazing initiative. And in, in many respects, Accounting for Nature wants to use the data it has subjects to data sharing agreements and whatnot to be able to um, feed in to some of those um, initiatives with, with the idea being that uh, in time uh, when we have enough data that uh, it can inform policy and program development and management on the ground. So um, we see that as really important once we, um, I, I often think of it like a bit of a, a patch, uh, a bit of a tapestry. We've got these accounts all over the country and as they, they connect together, um, our ability to, to make better decisions is gonna improve. And, and that's what the Atlas for Living Australia, I think is heading towards and doing in so many ways. 
Um, and so we'll be looking to feed into those sorts of things and into government decision making. Um, and at the moment, we're uh, Australian focused, but we are looking at taking this overseas and we've been in discussions in the US and New Zealand. And there's a, a great deal of interest in this. And uh, at the moment, it's sort of at the project proponent level, but governments as well uh, have, have been on board with us. Every state in Australia, more or less, has um, been interested in, in what we've been doing. And uh, we are supporting uh, government programs, particularly here in Queensland with the, the Land Restoration Fund. But um, the Western Australian government, Victoria, New South Wales, they've also shown interest in, in the, the kind of metrics we can develop to, to um, sort of achieve some of those broader environmental goods for states in, in the country. Perfect, thank you. Now, the next one relates to data management and handling. Uh, and it's asking who's undertaking ethical review for your data management and handling. So including issues like releasing data for aggregation. So it's kind of along the same vein. Yeah. So we have internal data handling processes um, to ensure that, um, you know, the data remains confidential. But uh, an important part of something like Accounting for Nature is to have transparency um, so that uh, the public, um, investors, whoever, can see what is underpinning the creation of an environmental account. So when a proponent decides to sign up for an environmental account, there is some requirement to be able to display that information. And so we have um, we'll have data sharing arrangements and stuff. And obviously the really granular data stays confidential. Um, but of course we need to be able to show what the, what's the econ made of. Um, and our verification processes are very stringent. So the auditors that we um, engage or the proponent engages, they will go through even the granular data, but that does stay private. So you, you can look on our website at the kind of information that is made available um, to the public. Great. All right, so when one part of the environment has changed, this can have a serious knock-on impact to other aspects. Can you predict that some decisions when considering that particular environment will have a negative impact on that environment in the future? Yeah, so in that example, the econ, I mean, is not meant to be predictive per se, but because it measures trends, you can, you can forecast where an econ is going, but the environment is so complex that it's very difficult to be able to say, you know, we've got an econ of 50 in five years time, it's gonna be 55. Um, and that's because, uh, you know, there might be drought, for example, is a great one in, in Australia. Um, there could be flooding, whatever, that you could have a fire go through and, and tear everything uh, up that you've been working hard to do. So the, the framework actually um, does incorporate something called a dynamic reference benchmark, which allows, um, a econ to be developed to take into account, you know, variations in the climate and things like that. Um, so in terms of forecasting into the future or being able to predict in that way, it, it is very tough just because of the, the vagaries of mother nature deciding, you know, when not happy, it decides to, to, to make itself known. Yeah, I can, if it's okay, I can just add to that as well. Um, and say that we are, while we're mainly working um, with landholders or carbon aggregators, we're also working at a larger scale. Um, so in the Bundaberg region, for example, they're doing a regional scale account, which is looking at the whole region. Um, and it would, that really allows you to see those sort of effects happening outside the potential project area where you're doing changes. And we are working um, across other regions in Australia as well. So we want this account to be used across all of Australia, so across all NRM bodies. And that really would allow you to track changes happening outside of your project area where you are making those changes. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, now this one I think is for you as well, Amanda. Uh, it starts with, thanks, uh, sorry. Can anyone with accounts experience do the training course or is this more for people with environmental slash scientific background? 
Yeah, so we have two different types of um, experts or two categories. Um, so one are those that actually build the environmental accounts that go out into the field or help with all the spreadsheets and remote sensing. The other types um, are the accountants that go through and review um, the actual accounts before they become published. Um, but so it's for both people um, and on our website we have more detailed information on the exact um, criteria required to become an expert. But again, if you if you something you're interested in, if you want to talk more about your personal circumstances, um, just send any of us an email um, and we can talk that process through with you. Cool. Now, Scott, I think this one relates more to your talk. Uh, it says, thanks for your talk. Uh, are there methods that can assess the marine environment as part of the marine spatial planning process? Yeah, so we're actually working up a marine method at the moment. Um, and with methods, Anyone can come to Accounting for Nature and say, we'd like to develop a method for a certain um, type of fauna or a soil type, or in the case of marine, it might be a particular species. It might be, we want to see how dugongs are going in a certain area. So we have got a, a marine method being developed at the moment. Um, and yeah, and once that's, I, I guess I should explain the process with methods is depending on who has made the method, they may allow it to be used publicly um, without any cost. Um, it's their IP. And we find that um, uh, several of our methods are available for anyone to use. So you can actually go to our website, download them right now and, and see exactly what a method looks like. But then others have actually spent a lot of money and time developing up a method and they may not make that um, available straight away because they want to use their own IP in developing their environmental accounts. Um, but um, anyone who wants to develop up an environmental account using a method can see that, that particular method and um, they can pay a, a fixed fee, one-off fixed fee that they pay to that uh, developer to use that method in their own environmental accounts. Okay. Um, one for Amanda, um, I think, uh, is how do you account for seasonality in your measurement of things like tree cover? Yeah, so the methods usually um, go through um, how to deal with seasonality. Um, so it can, there's two main approaches um, to do this. A lot of times when we speak about methods for native vegetation, it will tell you to measure in a specific season to make sure that you're consistent. Um, and we do recommend you to measure in the same month or at least the same season every year for your environmental account. However, if you do want to measure more often or if something happened that doesn't allow you to measure condition in that particular season, uh, we do also have, we can allow for different reference benchmarks to be established based on seasonality. That means you would compare your measures uh, against a different um, set of data for each season, basically. Um, and so if you really want to track environmental condition twice per year, for example, um, you can have those um, reference benchmarks being set for two different seasons um, so that you can still get a valid econ out of those. Yeah, cool. Yeah, great answer. Um, question in a, a slightly different vein, but how long do the ecosystem benefits last and how do you know? Well, the funny thing about the environment is change can positive change can take an incredibly large amount of time to happen, whereas negative change can happen really quickly. Um, and most of our projects actually will um, go over a really long period. So for example, this morning, I was looking at a project that goes for 40 years. So you can tell if the ecosystem benefits are lasting, if in 2020, they've got an econ of 20, um, and in 2035, that econ has gone up to 60, which is what you'd, you'd hope to see. You want to see it keep going up and up. Um, and that's the beauty of the econ. It's, um, it tells you how the, the ecosystem is responding to whatever management um, activities you're undertaking on that property or in that project. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant information and to have that way of measuring it you know, mm. makes perfect sense. Um, now to say this one's for you is, again, Scott, is I wonder if you could maybe share your funding model and this is at a high level. Yeah, of course. Um, well, we're not for profit and a registered charity. Um, so we're all about cost recovery. Um, we've got a large amount of funding as fee for service through, you know, assisting governments and things. Um, but our certification system also um, generates revenue um, by um, registering projects and, and certifying projects. 
Um, and all of that information is uh, available on our website. As I say, we're very transparent because we're not, we're in this, in the game to try and see some real big differences on the ground in our environment. Um, so anything you'd like to know in that respect, if you have a look at our quick uh, certification, quick guide and fee schedule, um, you can you can see exactly how much we're charging. Now, um, we've looked at certification schemes all over the world and we have tried to make our costs as cheap as possible. And once we get our technology platform up and running, um, we are looking to reduce our costs and continue to reduce our costs because as long as we can make things cost effective for people, then more people will take them up. And that means we'll get a better picture of the environment over time. Yeah. Um, are there other organizations in Australia that have or plan to establish a similar, account, a similar accounting system to accounting for nature? So do you have any competitors, I think is the question. <laughs> Yeah, um, and there are, there have been and there are attempts throughout um, Australia and, and overseas as well to um, develop a, a similar type of accounting system. The, the main niche that we hold is that scientific basis and that quantitative basis and the econ. And no one else has anything like that. They, they mix a, 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 they have a mixture of, of qualitative and quantitative measures and um, not necessarily always consistent. So we have a consistent and a quantitative basis to our uh, framework. And that's why I think we're seeing so much interest in it because you know um, it, you can't fudge it basically. It, it, um, it always comes down back to the numbers. Yeah. All right, so I'm looking through, we've had quite a list of questions here. Um, so does the econ have a monetary value in Australia, like the carbon price, so that it can be traded in markets or offsets? Now, that is an excellent question. And we never do a workshop or a talk without being asked that question. Yeah. Um, and I sort of alluded to the importance of market-based mechanisms in my talk earlier. And that's, that's so critical because if you can say, if you can value something in the environment uh, as, as with carbon, then you can start um, funneling investment in the right direction. So we're looking at how you could unitize, the, oh, you could provide a monetary um, amount to an econ. It's not easy. And our focus at the moment is really just getting the science out there and trying to develop as many accounts as possible. But that is definitely something we're very interested in because um, if people can uh, associate an econ, and, and dare I say, you know, if someone says, oh, saving the fluffy koala will be worth $1 a unit, then we might see, you know, you know big corporates like Qantas or what have you going, oh, let's, let's save the, the cute and fluffy animal sort of thing. And then, then they pour money into conservation er efforts and, you know, umbrella species then help the broader environment. So yeah, the short answer is, definitely interested in how we can make that happen. Yeah. Um, just looking at this one, it might relate to your funding model again. Um, it says, is taking a percentage of the environmental benefit funding part of your model or is it purely fee for service? Um, no, well, <laughs> um, certainly not taking a percentage of the environmental benefit. Um, the certification process is fixed um, costs and the like. So, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. I don't know how that would work, actually. Yeah, makes sense. And we have time maybe for one last question. I notice it's one o'clock, so this will be the last one that we take. Um, and it's an interesting question. It says, if climate change leads to climate change leads to quality degradation. Can that quality degradation due to climate change be distinguished from poor management practices? This, I don't know, do you, <laughs> I'm, I can answer this. Yeah. It's something that we've spoken about a fair bit actually in our framework, how we deal with the impacts of climate change. Um, and if we should actually change our reference uh, benchmark conditions based on climate change. Um, 
I guess at the moment, at least, um, what we've landed in is that the framework um, can actually be really useful in measuring the impacts of climate change. Um, and while that might not be possible to look at um, contribution on a single property, if we are measuring trends across broader region, then that will make it more likely for us to be able to actually attribute degradation um, to climate change, but we need to have bigger scale uh, measurements happening to actually be able to do that. Um, but so yeah, so we've decided that we are still keeping our old reference benchmark so that we can actually see the impacts of all of these things, even if it means that in the future we might not ever be able to reach a score of 100. And that might not be because of our management actions, but that might very well be because of climate change. Yeah, brilliant. So we've reached one o'clock. So thank you, both of you. It's been a really informative talk. I you know, love the detail um, and, and the whole concept, anything that's data-based, scientific, transparent, I think is absolutely wonderful. So thank you both for sharing that information and for sharing your time. Thank you to our audience for joining and for your wonderful questions. Um, and with that, I'm gonna wrap up and say goodbye to everyone. Thank you for joining today. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye.